In Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we have both access to the Father.
that you will carry with you from this sanctuary this morning. At least I hope they are. In the 17th chapter of Matthew, we find two words that could perhaps serve you in your life more than any other phrase you will ever know or understand from God's holy word. In the 17th chapter of Matthew, we find two words that are the key, the answers to those things that you've been searching for and not finding them in men ideas and institutions and philosophies and organizations. In the 17th chapter of Matthew, we find two words that summarizes for all eternity the greatest need that God's people will ever have and the greatest answer they will ever receive for those needs. And those two words are Jesus only. Jesus only. In the 17th chapter of Matthew, we read of an event that is called the transfiguration of Jesus. The transfiguration of our Lord. Those of you that have study Bibles in your hand, I'm sure have marginal notes to that effect. That this incident is referred to historically as the transfiguration of our Lord. And rightfully so, because that's the word that the Holy Spirit uses to describe what happened to Jesus on this occasion. And in the 17th chapter of Matthew, verse 1, we read these words. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter and James and John his brother and bringeth him up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And Jesus came and touched them. What a lovely, lovely view that is. And then verse 8. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And if I were to have an answered prayer this morning, it would be that when you lift up your eyes at the conclusion of this service this morning, you will see no man save Jesus only. And we're going to examine this event known as the transfiguration of Christ and find a practical application for your life 
and my life. For as glorious as this event was, if we can't fit it into our lives today, then it doesn't serve us very well. But I'll promise you, what happened there on that mountain 2,000 years ago still can happen today and still has a great application for you in your life. Look first of all at the place, the place that this took place in verse 1. Jesus took Peter and James and John. And by the way, John was the only one of the gospel writers who was there and the only one of the gospel writers who doesn't record the event. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do. John doesn't. So Peter and James and John that inner circle of Jesus. And oh, to be a part of the inner circle of Jesus. And there's no secret to how one becomes part of that inner circle. To become close to Jesus is a matter of spending time with him. He never turns away when we spend our time with him in heartfelt prayer. He never pushes us aside when we engage in the study of his word and see him and learn of him. That's how one becomes part of this inner circle of which consisted Peter and James and John. And he led them up onto a high mountain apart, which means a mountain by themselves. Jesus favored mountains. I grew up in the Valley of the Sun. We were surrounded by mountains on all sides. I spent many an evening after milking the cows, looking out on those mountain ranges, and wishing I was on top of one of those mountains just then to look back in the valley and to view what things look like from those high and lofty peaks and often did just that. But there's something about a mountain and Jesus recognized that. It was a place where he often went to be alone. If you turn back to the Bible just a page or two, to Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, we see again Jesus' preference for the mountains. And uh, after a long day, we read in verse 23 of Matthew 14, he sent the multitudes away and he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. And the idea here is that he wanted a secluded place to, to be alone with his father. Now, you don't have to be on top of a mountain to do that. I'll tell you the quietude of your den, the quietude of your, the quietude of your study, even the quietude of the inside of your automobile on the way to work can be a mountaintop experience when you are alone there with God in prayer. The idea is you need that time, brethren. You need that time to separate yourselves from all those things that trouble you because you are human. Because you must live in this world that has its challenges. And you need the time with God. And with that time, certainly those challenges threaten to overcome you. Jesus gave us a great example in that he, even as God, needed to get away by himself to pray to the Father 
in heaven. Peter would refer back to that event in 2 Peter 1.18 and call this mountain the holy mountain. And you know, no one knows which mountain that was. If you take the trip to the holy mountain today, they'll take you to a mountain and they'll call it the Mount of Transfiguration. Don't, don't <laughs> spend your money on that tour. There is no one that knows which mountain that was. I had a dream once that I was on that mountain and I know it was just a dream. Maybe it was more than that. But I was on that mountain and I was witnessing that transfiguration. And the one thing I brought away from that dream was that we weren't bitterly cold as one would be if one were atop Mount Hermon, which is the location some choose for the Mount of Transfiguration. But there was a warm Mediterranean breeze blowing in our face which gave me some internal evidence that probably that mountain wasn't so far away from where Jesus' public ministry was conducted, a place that was always accessible and a place that he and his disciples could report to to regain their strength for the tasks ahead. The place, and then there's the period when did this take place? It was nearing the time of the cross. And this is very important for you and me to understand. Jesus was coming to the point now that the cross was very real. It was very near. The time of his passion was at hand. And don't think for one moment that did not affect Jesus' body, mind, and soul. In the garden, he prayed his heart out. He prayed to his father, such was the suffering. Father, if it be possible, you know, let this cup, let this suffering pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And now as that time of suffering appeared, Jesus keenly felt the need to get away for time alone with the father. And uh, we know that that time is drawing near because the discussion on that mountain was nothing else other than about Jesus' impending death. There on the mountain, as records it in 931, Jesus talked with Moses and with Elijah about death. Now that's something to chew on for a moment, isn't it? Here is God Almighty. Here is your Savior. Here is the one who had never tasted death, but is about to taste death for all men. Here is one that brings Elijah and Moses to him with them about his impending death. Luke 9 31 words it that when he appeared here in this glorious state he spent his decease which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. I talked about you know Moses died there on the plain of Pisgah overlooking the promised land and ever set foot on it and the angels buried Moses as far as we know and Elijah never really died he was carried up to heaven in a whirlwind those two men are the men that Jesus brought aside to talk about his own death with and about that he talked and he'd gone Pray and talk with these men. It's an amazing thing to me that these two saints who were in heaven should be called back for these brief moments for this encounter with Christ. What must it have been for them? Well, we can't speculate, but we only know for a few brief shining moments 
there on a mountain somewhere in the Holy Land, Jesus stood with the man who gave the law, to, God gave the law to, and he stood with the chief among the prophets, and there he discussed his own death. So that's the period. The people, well, there are seven persons that are named here. There are two from the past. We have Moses and Elijah. Moses, I suppose, representing the prophets. Uh, I'm the law. And uh, Elijah representing the prophets. There were three men from the present. They were Peter. They were James and John. And then they're present there from eternity. Jesus and the Father. So that's the gathering there on the Mount of Transfiguration. Now we've seen the place, the period, the people. Let's look at the phenomena itself. What actually took place? Well, we read in this 17th chapter, verse 2, that Jesus was transfigured before them. Transfigured meant a change. And I'll say a word or two more about that in a few moments. But there was a change that took place. A monumental, unprecedented change took place in Jesus' form there on that mountain. And at the height of that change, there was a salvation that was led by none other than Peter, who said in verse 4 of this 17th chapter of Matthew, Peter said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let's make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and I. Now, Peter was always caught up in things. God bless him. He always was overcome by the event. And I can identify with that. All of us react to things in different ways. Peter was always awe-inspired by new and wonderful things. And he kind of jumped the gun a little bit. He always kind of came to conclusions that weren't exactly centered on what the event was all about. So in his excitement, Peter said, hey, we got a churches here. We'll build one church for Elijah there. We'll build one church for Moses. And Lord, we'll even build one church for you. Isn't that the way it is with man? We always want to confine the wonderful things of God to little geographical man-made places. There are three churches down near Plant City, Florida that I'll never forget. As you drive out of Plant City, you go past this nice little white clapboard church, old church, pretty church dating back to the late 1800s. And then a block away, there's another church. Looks something like that, except somewhat newer. And then a third church that also is modeled after the first two architecturally, but is the newest of the and what happened with those, with those three churches is the old mother church split and formed a new church. And the old church gave them the land to start the new church there on the same property. So now we have churches started by man. Well, then that church split. And we were all good friends and relatives. So that church gave property for the third congregation to build their little house of worship. So you have one, two, three churches, and three of them are more and nothing less than man's minds to himself. 
and his own erroneous idea about God. And certainly there is no Jesus only in any of those three, nor would there have been in these three new religions that Peter would have come up with, the tabernacle of Moses, the tabernacle of Elijah, the tabernacle of Jesus, well, which one would you have gone to and belonged to? Of course, that celebration was ill-advised. And so a great cloud came over it. And we read in verse 5a, while he spake that was yet speaking in this ill-advised manner, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. There it is, Peter. There it is. You've got your own idea about how to go about Establishing a religion here on this mountain. Well, let me tell you how it really works. If you want to do the thing, Peter, if you want a monument, a testimony to God on this mountain, this is how you go about it, and this is how you go about it still to this day. You look not to Jesus nor any man. You look not to Elijah or any man, no matter how they are. And you look to my son, Jesus Christ, God says, it is he with whom I am well pleased, and you hear him. There are a lot of voices that are trying to get your attention, brothers and sisters. The airways are full of them. The neighborhoods are full of them. Your families are full of them. The organizations you belong to are full of them. Your institutions are full of them. Voices trying to get your attention and convince you to turn this way or that way. But I'll tell you, God would put a cloud over it all for you, my friend, if he were to steer you this morning in the right direction. And he would point you to none other than Jesus Christ. And he would say, brother, sister, boy, girl, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And then we come to the purpose of it all in verses 6 through 8. And when the disciples heard it, that is God, they fell on their face and they were afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. This transfiguration was a preview. It was a preview of something. It was a preview of change. That word transfigured is related to the word you're familiar with, metamorphosis. The springtime is a time of metamorphosis, especially in our part of the country, where the, uh, the, the caterpillar becomes the butterfly. And the seed becomes the plant. All of these beautiful examples of changes. And that's what this transfiguration was all about. Christ's transformation from earthly form into a supernatural form was a view of change that is all who are changed from the earthly to the heavenly. Paul speaks of that in 1 Corinthians. Uh, we read this often, of course, uh, in funerals, but I don't understand why we reserve it there. There's a wonderful transformation 
And there on that mountain, you know what the disciples saw? They saw Jesus the man. They saw that born in the manger. They saw that son of flesh. They, they saw that son of Joseph and Mary, yet the son of God. They saw him with that earthly flesh. With the suffering, they saw him with the mark of age that were premature upon him. They saw him that and saw him transformed into a heavenly form. In other words, what he looks like in heaven, in the glorified estate. Now, the thing I look about, I like about that, rather, is that he was still Jesus. He still had form, but everything about him was perfect. And in that, we see a preview of our own transformation, our own metamorphosis. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, when he says, or verse 51, I show you a mystery, we'll not all sleep. That is, we're not all going to die, but Jesus is going to come again, and when he does, we'll all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It's a wonderful thing. Those of us who die before the Lord comes, we're going to be resurrected and we're going to have changed bodies. Those of us who are alive when he comes, our bodies are going to be changed just like Jesus' life was changed there on the mountain. It was a preview. And the transfiguration was also a preparation. These were, the, were going to be tough, confusing times, trying days for these disciples as Jesus now was going to be taken away from them and he was going to be tried and he was going to be crucified and they weren't going to know how to deal with it. They were going into the unknown and brothers and sisters, some of you are going to unknowns, into unknowns in your life as well. Maybe not at the same level, but to you as these unknowns were to these disciples. Their minds and their hearts must be centered on Jesus and God takes up there on this mountain and rips everything away. He takes all of their wisdom, even Peter's great tabernacles, and, and he hides the whole thing in a cloud and then when it dissipates, they see Jesus, and they see Jesus only, and God wants for them to have their attention centered on him because in the days to come, the only thing that's going to do them any good is for their eyes to be on Jesus. It was Paul that wrote in Hebrews 12 that we should look to Jesus. We have a Song that's written on that theme and I'll tell you whatever it is right now, whatever it is you have ahead of you whatever your task is God would take you on top of this mountain and he would prepare you and he would put your mind on Jesus not another man not another person not philosophy not another not organization, not another self-help book, not another idea of your own logical thinking process, but here it is, I on Jesus, there's your answer. And the transfiguration was finally, it was a pattern, it was a pattern focus of the gospel, Jesus only. Now, I know it is popular for us to say, well, you know, I want to see Jesus in another. I want to see Jesus in this person. But I'll tell you, you can't see Jesus only in the of any individual. For the very best of us are sinners, and whatever Jesus you see in me is going to be imperfect. 
you'll never see the true, pure Jesus of the gospel as God presents him. And these disciples saw him looking to any man because I am a sinner and you're a sinner and the best you're ever going to know is a sinner. And to see Jesus in that man is to see Jesus through the lens of that man's own weakness and sin. The study of Jesus, my friend, is Jesus. The focus of the Word of God is not me. The focus of the Word of God is Jesus. And when we present him to someone else, our own family and others, we must present Jesus alone and not the things that we interpret out of our own lives that constitute who and what Jesus is. He is a pattern for the focus of the gospel. This was a pattern for the facing of all challenges in life, Jesus only. And it is a pattern for the final outcome of all things. Brothers and sisters, when the smoke clears and this earth shall go into its final night and time shall be no more and all of history is settled and man has done his best and man has done his worst, all of your ideas about the things and all of your hopes and aspirations, they're all going to pale. And I want to tell you, when that comes, it is Jesus only. No matter what the world is telling you and no matter what you think, when it all comes down to that final, last, grand and glorious moment, it is Jesus that comes with cloud. And when you lay on your deathbed looking across Jordan's chilly shore, it will be the sound of Moses or Elijah or your preacher or any human organism. Or that will be within the view of your spiritual sight. It will be Jesus. On this world's last day, my friends, settle it now. Because it will be settled then. It is the Son of Man that shall come in his glory, Matthew writes. And all the holy angels with him. And then shall he, that is Jesus only, sit upon the throne of his glory. In the end, it is Jesus only with whom you have to do. May it be so now in your life is my prayer for Christ's sake and amen.